Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. And uh, we're gonna show some love to the rhythm section today. I've got literally one of the finest, most seasoned, coolest guys, drummers in Nashville. We're with the one and only Greg Morrow. Uh, this guy's got a resume. I mean, I'm just gonna touch, uh, you know, this is the iceberg I'm gonna even talk about, man, but there's a whole mess of stuff underneath there. You know uh, what icebergs do, they sink ships. <laughs> well, you're, you're floating ships, man, I know that. A uh, Couple of quick announcements, make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe and subscribe to the audio and the YouTube channel. And if you are watching this on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and the little bell there. All righty, Greg Morrow, first call session and touring drummer out of Nashville for well over 20 years. Is that 20 or 30? Uh, 20, let's see, what year is this? It's uh, 24 years, be 24 years in August of this year. Right on, 24 years. He grew up in Memphis, and at age, the ripe old age of 11, he participated yeah. in his first recording session. Yeah, sure did. In it the, was, uh, uh, what was that? It, well, it was, uh, it was, we went into, we were going to be on a little local TV show there called Swing Shift, which ironically was a, was an R and B show, uh, that came on Friday nights about 11 PM. And, uh, the host was named Harry, Harry Winfield. And, uh, man, what a memory you got from 11. Well, it, it, <laughs> That's it pretty impressive. Leave a mark, you know, for, for that. And, Anyway, so, you know, back in those days, you went to a, to a studio and did your dub tape, you know, that you were, because you were going to lip sync, uh, you know, on the TV show. And we went to a little studio called Sonic Recording, which uh, uh, was owned by Roland James, if you, if you know Roland from Sun. You know, Roland, he, he worked at Sun, played guitar, was a guitarist there and engineered there, played on... Jerry Lee Lewis records and Billy Lee Riley and the little green men. And, and, uh, and, and, and Roland was, I mean, he was an amazing guy, amazingly talented guy, always had studios. And so he, he, he did the first session I ever did well, was at his studio. And, uh, we went in and set up and there were no headphones and we cut straight to mono singing and playing live all at the same time. With, with no monitoring at all. So we, we just kind of had to blend ourselves on the floor and let him grab what he could. And, and, uh, and it, and actually for, for, you know, for what we were, it was okay. You know, it was okay for a bunch of punk kids. 11 year olds. Hell yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the eighties, Greg toured and recorded with the commercially successful Christian band DeGarmo and key. And yeah. he was then part of Amy Grant's touring band. In uh, 96, Greg moved to Nashville, and again, this is literally a tiny tip of the iceberg. He's played on records with the following artists, uh, Blake Shelton, Don Henley, Joe Bonamassa, Billy Gibbons, Bob Seger, Steve Earle, Sonny Landreth, 38 Special. Did you, didn't, this, did you play with Jeff Carlisi by any chance? No, Jeff wasn't in the band then. That's what I thought. Uh, John Jorgensen, who I had on here, what a player. Um, the Johnson Warren Drake. brothers. Yeah, I had Brad Warren on here. He's got a good story too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Funny guy. Uh, Brooks and Dunn, Darius Rucker, Vince Gill, Steve Warner, who we had on here, Reba McIntyre, Deanna Carter, Leanne Rimes, Cindy Lauper. I've had a ton of her musicians on here. Did you play with um who was the bass player on that gig? On that session, let's see, I'm trying to remember. It was a, it was a real quick session. Uh, Jimmy Lee Slows. Oh, okay. Session, yeah. It was that little, she, you know, she came to Nashville to do, really, she wanted to do some legit kind of country music. And uh, one of the things I played on was a duet with she and Vince. And, uh, cool. uh, and it was fun. She was really sweet. And, you know, man, she came, she came through town the next year uh, opening for Rod Stewart. And she called everybody on that date and offered them tickets to the show. Uh, wow to, that's to really out. nice he just said i wanted to thank you for what you did on the record and if if anybody wants to come out i want to have you know anybody that wants to come please come and 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 my wife and i went and and uh and she yeah she was man she brought it too she was great live golly bill what a nice kind i mean nobody does that that's no, pretty no, unheard of no, no it's 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 the it was a a level of thoughtfulness you don't you don't see much anymore 
That's nice, man. Uh, Warren Haynes, which I'll ask you about. He's coming on here soon. Uh, Haddon Sayers, he's coming on here in a few weeks, man. I'll ask you that's about that, great. too. I've known Haddon a long, long time. Nice guy, yeah. Trisha Yearwood, the Dixie Chicks, and literally hundreds of other people. Uh, Greg's also a member of Big Al Anderson's band, Al from NRBQ, of course. They're called the World Famous Headliners. And along with Big Al, Pat McLaughlin, Sean Camp, and Michael Rhodes on bass, uh, the band, uh, Greg has, that's, that's part of the World Famous Headliners. And Greg has won Academy of Country Music Drummer of the Year Award twice. Man, thank you so much. It's so good to talk with you. Well, thank you. Thanks for asking. My pleasure, man. Uh, so how did you start playing at, at 11? Did you, were you like a musical family or? Well, you know, actually, I, I started playing a lot earlier than that. Um, uh, I, I think I got my real first real made out of wood drum set when I was about six or seven. Oh, wow. And, uh, and yeah, it, it, you know, it did start with my family. Um, I was, I was funny. I was thinking about that this morning cause I thought this one might come up, but, um, on my dad's side of the family, but it was on both sides of the family, but my, my grandfather on my dad's side had a, um, uh, a little arch top Wabash guitar that he got from Montgomery Ward mail order catalog or something. And that was, that was probably the first instrument I ever physically touched in my life. And I, and I, and he would, he would play it when I was a little, little tiny boy. Uh, you know, he'd play it and just kind of moan around, you know, and stomp his foot and play, play guitar, you know, finger pick a little bit. And, uh, and, 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 um, and my dad's little brother, my uncle Dale, uh, was a teenager when I was born and he had, uh, well, he had records, and I was going to say he had a record collection, but you wouldn't really call it a collection at the time. It was just a handful of records. They were dirt poor. But, but he wound up having these records, and he would play these records. Uh, you know, when I was three and four years old, he, he would have his little record player out and be playing these records, and it was Fats Domino and, and Elvis and Jerry Lee and Little Richard. And I, and I just remember, you know, the Little Richard records in particular – if that doesn't work your monkey nerve, you, you know, you're not. Yeah, man, you're if, dead. <laughs> if that doesn't just drive you into just a frenzy. Yeah. And, and so it was all of that stuff. And, 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 uh, and both sides of the family sang in church, you know, sang in quartets or trios. And so there, there was a lot of music around. Uh, none, of, none of it was ever, none of them were ever like musicians as far mm. as doing this for a living or anything. But it was, there was always music around because it was a, it was a, I guess a free commodity. You know, it was something you you created yourself. You know, you didn't so, have to buy it. So I'm, they were probably really supportive when you wanted to go into music as a career. Uh, n not exactly. <laughs> 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 not exactly. No, my dad, my, my dad took him a long, long, long time to come to terms with it. He he. Yeah. What did he do? What kind of work did your dad do? He was in the cotton business. He, right. uh, he worked right downtown, right on the river in Memphis. And, and he worked for a company called wheel brothers cotton. And he had gotten this job when my, when, when he and my mom got married, he had gotten this job. Uh, his uncle GT worked at this cotton company and got him on down there. And, uh, and he wound up, he would go around, he, he had a company station wagon and he would drive all around the Delta uh, picking up cotton samples from all the gins in the area, you know, cotton's king. And, uh, and he would come back I mean, at station wagon full from the, the back window to the back of the front <laughs> seats, stuffed to the ceiling with, you know, cotton samples. And, uh, and he would take them back to the, uh, you know, to the office there and, uh, and grade them. They'd okay. have to grade them and, and, and categorize them and figure out what they wanted to buy for what, you know? And, uh, and so that was his, that was his business. That's what, that's what he did for a living. Wow. That sounds like something from a million years ago today, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, that's it does. wild. That's mm -hmm. really cool. It's interesting. Uh, when you said earlier, before we started recording, I, I said, do you read a lot or are you a writer? Cause you speak very colorfully. And you said a lot of that's from the South. 
And then you mentioned the Delta. I have a guy coming on my show. He's actually a, a best-selling author. He's written five books and he's from the Delta. And all of his books, I've read two of them now, take place there. And the language is very colorful, just like what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a cool. What's his name? Michael Farris Smith. Huh. Great. I mean, five books, best selling. Uh, he is from Oxford, Mississippi. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, Faulkner. Yeah. Right. And uh, right. He, he talks about that in his, he has a little bio in there and uh, it's just me being a guy from New York city, I can feel the, you know, the cultural vibe. And it's so cool to, to like, uh, I imagine it's so cool to have grown up in a place like that where you have all this color in, in life going on. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's different. It, it's, uh, you know, not to wax philosophic here, but, but I mean, that's one of the beauties of us as a nation. Yeah. The Northeast is not like the South is not like the West is not like the Midwest. And, and right. that's what gives us our unique qualities and perspectives that we share with each other. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and, and I mean, it's a shame uh, that, that even to this day, you still have people going, well, well, he's just a dumb old Southern redneck. It's like, well, <laughs> I know, man, it's really weird. Yeah. I know in 2020, I know just crazy but yeah i i mean i i got to say I, I i consider i had a charmed very blessed uh raising in west tennessee and along the mississippi river and just you know getting to run up and down mississippi and louisiana and and uh and just being being you know it's formative to me it's yeah it's, just as you know new york is formative to you you know we carry those things with us through our lives and Right on. That's it. That's it, man. Even whether you love it or hate it, it's a part of you, man. And it's shaped, yeah. you know, a lot of your meter inside who you are, man. Sure. Um, okay. So how did you first, how did you first get started in the actual music business and what was your first break? Uh, well, you know, all through high school and all that stuff. Um, I, I, I was in working bands. Um, I mean, I made what money I made, I made playing, uh, literally starting, I guess, my freshman year of high school. Uh, we stayed pretty busy, and, and uh, there was a Navy base in Millington, uh, that, which was a great gig to have because they'd book you for week-long stints, uh, and, uh, and the money was, at the time, really good. I think uh, we'd come home with... 300 bucks a man a week, but that was in 19. Oh my God. 1972. That's a boatload of money. Yeah. That's a boatload of money for, for a 13, 14 year old kid to come that's home. Probably it's 50 years ago. That's probably 1500. I mean, a thousand dollars at least. It was great money. So you'd love to have those Navy base gigs. Yeah. And then, and then also that, that same area, they had regular little, you know, regular nightclubs too. So if you weren't playing on the base, you'd just go play the clubs, you know, uh, where the ruffians would come. <laughs> but that was fun. So, you know, I, I mean, just literally from the time I could be out there playing and could get myself to gigs and back, um, I, I was a gigging drummer. And, and man, it just, uh, it just kind of never stopped. It just kind of, it just kind of took little steps and little steps and little steps. And I guess you would say my first, what you would call a break. Uh, there was a guy, it was a band in Memphis called Larry Raspberry and the High Steppers. And Larry had been in a band called the Gentries in the sixties. They had a top five hit with a song called keep on dancing. So he, he was, you know, he was very well thought of and, you know, he was a very successful Memphis musician. He was one of those guys. And I have to back up a little bit because when I was a, to kind of frame this story, when, when I was a sophomore in high school, uh, they, they had a record come out. They were on Enterprise, which was supposed to be the, the, the rock leg of Stax Records was supposed to be Enterprise. Um, 
they had a record come out on Enterprise, and we were driving home from my grandparents one night, and, and I had convinced my dad to listen to uh, uh, FM 100, which was the rock station in town. Well, there was a band playing live on the radio from Ardent Studios, and it was the High Steppers, and they were they were playing their they were performing their album in the studio in front of like 50 people, you know, and being broadcast live. With the, and I remember hearing this and thinking, man, this is great. I love this. This is really cool. So I went and bought the record, you know, and, and became a big fan of the record. Well, uh, I guess later that summer. So well, this was probably 74. Mid, mid 70s. Yeah. Okay. You said FM radio. So I'm thinking, yeah. yeah. Um, Jackson, Tennessee, which is about 60 miles due east of Memphis. Uh, the home of rockabilly, they call it, because Carl Perkins from there. Oh, I didn't but know that. Anyway, okay. they decide they're going to have a big rock festival in, in the summer in, in Jackson, Tennessee. And, and it's Blue Oyster Cult and Nazareth, and, and KISS is supposed to be there. It's just when the first year, you know, first year KISS was around. Well, anyway... Um, we go, we show up to this rock festival in Jackson, Tennessee, and it's at the rodeo arena, you know, dry, dusty, just horrible, you know, oh my gosh, the setting was just, it was just horrible. We get there, we find out Kiss has decided they're not coming, but, but Nazareth is there and Blue Oyster Cult's there and a band from St. Louis called Pavlov's Dog and Larry Raspberry and the High Steppers had been, had been called to take Kiss's place. Oh, right on for you on this show. So, uh, but I mean, I, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see them. You know, I'm excited to see the band I like. Right. Well, they, they, I, I shouldn't go into just all this, but it's, it, it's just all logged into my brain. It, this thing just deteriorates through the day. Right. Oh they, man. It, it's the, the, the power is, uh, uh, not substantial. It won't run. You know, they can't. Nazareth tries to start their set twice and the power goes off at the same point in the first song twice <laughs> in a row. So they bail, right? They bail. Um, Pavlov Dog stumbles kind of through their set. They have a Mellotron that will not stay in tune because it doesn't have enough voltage. Uh, so they sound kind of horrible. Uh, they take a long break and they get someone goes and gets a civil defense generator, right? And brings it to the, uh, to the rodeo arena. And this is about late afternoon. So they get this thing fired up and blue oyster cult gets to play and they play their whole set and man, they just blew it up. They just, uh, it was amazing. And I, this was when their third album had come out and I was a big fan of them too. Who took, was this, you went with your buddies or your parents took you to the show? My cousins. Okay, that's My cool. Cousins. Yeah, I had older cousins. Anyway, so Blue Oyster Cult plays, and, you know, everybody's thinking, great. Well, by the time they finish, the sun's going down, and there's no lights. So they're having to pull the plug on the festival. And I'm noticing over here at the side of the stage, Larry and the band have gotten their gear out of the truck, you know, because they're, they're going to close the night, right? Well, the word comes down that the show's over. Uh people lose their minds. They're throwing beer bottles and all this stuff. And I'm like, I run over to where, where Larry is as he's trying to load the van up and said, Larry, 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 man, my name's Greg. I'm from Memphis. I love your record. I'm just, you know, just rambling. I'm just running off at the mouth. I don't know how much I love his record and blah, 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 blah. And you know, I've listened to it. I know all your songs. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, you know, great kid. See you. You know, thanks for speaking They're They're hauling butt. Right. Well, fast forward about two or three years, and I, you know, I've been working at a music store there in town. I see Larry come in and out a few, few times, you know, so we, he, he kind of knows my face and, you know, remembers the event. <clears throat> well, I'm in a, uh, I'm in a, a, a band that's making pretty good money. We're, we're playing uh, uh, up in East Tennessee, up in Knoxville area. And I get this phone call at the hotel room. And I, I uh, you know, I'm answering for hello. It's just, it's just Greg. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah. He said, well, this is Larry Raspberry. And I'm like, 
okay. <laughs> he said, I hope you don't mind me tracking you down. He said, I had to call your parents <laughs> to find out where you were. It's funny. They told it's me cute. you were out of town, but he said, I, I found out who you are from, from Big Dave. I said, he said, I went to the music store. I said, you know that kid that says he knows all my songs? <laughs> I, he, Dave said, yeah, I know. He said, what's his phone number? Well, come to find out, Chad Cromwell was playing with Larry at the time, and they, were, they had two weeks left on a tour, and, and Chad was going to have to bail on the tour. He had to have surgery. Oh, and man. he was, Larry was looking for anybody to come fill these two weeks. Wow. And he finally got down to me and tracked me down in Knoxville on a Saturday afternoon. And so I, we play, we play the gig on Saturday. I drive home Sunday. I repack all my drums and he's got me an airline ticket to Madison, Wisconsin on a Monday. And, uh, so I fly to Madison with my entire drum kit as checked baggage. Oh my God. Can you imagine that? No. <laughs> like 13 pieces of checked baggage. <laughs> oh, <my drum kit. laughs> anyway, they fly me up there. We, we rehearse one time and I play the next two weeks with him. And I could, I consider that my kind of break into. Yeah okay, these guys have a record, blah, blah, you know what I'm saying? And, and yeah. I, wound up, I wound up staying in the band. And, and this was actually before DeGarmo and Key, just before DeGarmo and Key. And, um, and we, you know, we wound up, like I said, I wound up staying with the band. Brig, that's where I met Brig Nadello. Oh, he, was he in the band too? He was out there on that tour. Oh, that is nice, man. Yeah, so the two guys were with the rhythm section. Yeah, uh-huh. Oh, that's awesome, man. He was, he was on that tour. We, we, you know, we, like I said, we stayed together, stayed in the band. We wound up getting a record deal with Mercury and, uh, and doing a record there in Memphis for, for Mercury Records. And, and like I said, all of that was right before the Girl in the so. Man, what a great story. It's, what was it, Larry Raspberry and the Drifters? The High Steppers. And the High Steppers. That's so cool. Uh, for people listening, um, Greg was talking about Mike Brignadello, great bass player. Uh, if you haven't heard his interview, check it out. Uh, he was on the show a while, but lovely guy. And just like a, like Greg, a pedigree resume, his last name is Brignadello, B-R-I-G-N-A-R-D-E-L-L-O. So if you haven't heard that one, and that's like, like he told their manager, he changed it to that. <laughs> that, was, that was his original family name. His dad had shortened it to Briggs. And when he got married, he wanted to take the family name back. So he, he, he put it back to Brignadello. Oh, I didn't know. That's cool, man. And when he was with Giant, uh, he, he would tell the story about Bud Prager calling him into the office. And he's thinking, oh, God, I'm getting fired already. He said, Mike, we got to talk about the name. Said, what, what about the name? He said, Brignadello, what am I supposed to do with that? He said, hey, Bud, I changed it to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's great yeah that's right he was what i'm gonna do with you that's cool man oh that's nice that you guys played together um what what prompted you to move to nashville and once you first got to town how did you kind of get started because you know that's a tough town to break into well it, it is a tough it is tough um the prompting it was just getting tougher and tougher to uh to to get anywhere in memphis uh i had a studio down there and I, we would literally that's where oddly enough i hadn't sayers would come and, and do records at my studio in memphis that's wild and uh but you know it was just hunt and peck it was like a chicken pecking you know feed out in the field i mean you just would just keep your head down looking for any scrap of work to do and you know, if you, if you wanted to play four gigs a week, you better have at least three bands to do it. Oh, and, right. And, and it just, you know, it was just getting tougher and tougher and tougher. My daughter was getting ready to start school. And, um, and I had, uh, I had had a few opportunities to come up and do a couple of things. Uh, I met a, a, a guy up here named uh, Bobby Fields, RS Field that, you know, produced Sonny and, Web Wilder and, and some folks like that. And he brought me up to do some recording on a, a Web Wilder record. And I had Web on the show. He's another nut. <laughs> yeah, he's, I love Web, man. He's a funny guy. Yeah. He's, he's fun as hell to play with. Too. 
I mean, to play his gigs is just a blast. But anyway, uh, and um, Norbert Putnam, Putnam had had brought me up to play on a couple of things. Why do I know that name? He's he's a big oh, time Norbert, producer. Yeah, isn't he? He, was, he was one of the very original Shoals guys with Rick Hall and all that. Okay, he played with Elvis and you know produced Dan Fogelberg and Jimmy Buffett and I mean he Norbert's the real deal. He's the real deal. Anyway, I, I had met him. Yeah, I'd met him in Memphis, uh, cutting some stuff with Jimmy Webb, songwriter Jimmy Webb. Yeah, I know who that is. And it just, you know, every now and again out of the blue, he'd call me and, and ask me to do something. Uh, we just kind of hit it off. And, and anyway, so I, 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 I had my toe dipped in the water, I guess you would say. Sure. But I didn't have enough going on to, to, to really make a move. Uh, so I, I probably in 94, I rented a room in a friend of mine's house and got a little phone line. You know, the perception is reality. Yeah. So yeah. They can call a local number and leave you a message in their mind. You're there. Sure. If you're in Memphis or not, but I, I would just try to spend as much time up here as I could. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just like anything else. You, you, I, I was fortunate because I did have some friends that had come from Memphis, you know, Brignar had come up here long before I did and a songwriter named Trey Bruce. And, and, and they were all very involved in things and, and they would tell me, man, you know, this is something you could do, but you, you know, you got to commit to it. If you're going to do it, you, know, you can do it, but you, you just got to commit to it. Right. And, um, you know, it was just a, uh, uh, slight bit serendipitous, uh, Along this same time, uh, uh, Chad Chad had done a couple of showcases with uh, uh, Faith Hill, whose first album was just getting ready to come out, and they were looking to put together a band. They and they had been having some auditions, and they hadn't found who they wanted in the drum chair yet. And I got a call from her producer Scott Hendricks that Chad uh, Cromwell had told him, you know, you should call this guy in Memphis and see. If he might want to come up and, and, and audition. So he sent me some material and I, and I came up and played and, and they, they offered me that, that chair. And, and so that, you know, that was a, a good immersion in the local show enough around town, Nashville, you know, that was a Nashville producer and a Nashville record and a Nashville act. And, and ironically enough, we were the, we were the third act on the bill on a Reba tour, you know, oh. we wind up working for her later as well. But anyway, uh, it was just, just all of that, you know, the, all those things kind of happened. Uh, and like I said, I still lived in Memphis at the time. And I, and I remember the, I guess really the thing that lit the fuse. Uh, I remember one night after a faith show and Scott, was out with us. He called me to the back of the bus and it was one of those things you think you, you know, you automatically go to the worst. Oh crap. What have I done? I'm getting fired. You know, getting fired. <laughs> I think that's normal. I don't know. We all do that, yeah, man. You yeah. never go back and think, man, this is going to be great. I'm getting a raise. Like, why yeah, don't we think no, of that? Cause we have that choice. <laughs> let yourself go there. Anyway, I go, I go back there and he said, man, you know, I just got to tell you, um, he, and he, and I always credit him for this. Uh, he, he said, you don't need to be doing this. And I wow. said, he said, he said, man, uh, this is going to do what it's going to do, but, but you, you need to come to Nashville. He said, you can make records. You can, you can be one of those guys up here. And, um, uh, but, but, you know, you, you got, you need to come on up. You need to make that commitment and come on up. He said, I, you know, I can't tell you I'll hire you for everything I ever do. I may never hire you, but, but I know you can do this. And, and, and I just think, I just think you need to make that decision. And wow. I guess that's really kind of gave me the confidence to, you know, to do it. And, and, you know, plus the, the thing about, you know, everything changing in Memphis and, you know, the, life changes with daughters yeah. and school and all that stuff. And so we, we just, we started looking for houses and looking for neighborhoods and, you know, it all, it all fell into place pretty quickly once we started 
started look we i mean we we were very blessed man we we um you know we try to live very faithfully and uh and 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 trust in that and trust in that spiritual guidance and and uh, and stuff and and uh, we feel like we were just put right literally exactly in the spot we needed to be because we had great neighbors that loved our daughter wow and uh, you know my wife traveled for a living she was a flight attendant and and I was still traveling some so we needed extra help and and we had it on three sides of of in our neighborhood and uh, and it just you know, the school couldn't have been any better. The neighborhood couldn't have been, nothing, nothing could have been any better in where we landed. And, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, I'm just so thankful for that. I'm grateful for it. But, uh, you know, and, and once, you know, once, once we landed up here, man, it just, it hit the on ramp and we're cruising at 75 and, you know, the first, first couple of things I'm doing in town are, you know, uh, strawberry wine and, and, uh, one way ticket with, uh, Leanne rhymes, both of them went to number one. And, you know, when, when that happens for you, pe- people, ca- people feel safe to call you because they know you're not going to blow up the date. The yeah, first man. things you've played on have been huge successes. And, uh, and, you know, so they know it ain't going to be your fault. You're not going to ruin the record. <laughs> well, know. the opposite is going to happen, man. You're going to enhance the record. You know, well, that's why they're going to yeah, call you. Yeah. You know, I got to say the first time, the first, uh, real show enough walked into a room of people I didn't know at all. Um, and, and they were all, every one of them, it was Brent Rowan and, and John Hobbs and Biff Watson and Larry Franklin and Dan Dugmore and Joe Chimay. And I'm walking in there. they, I'm not the guy they're used to seeing behind the drum kit. All right. I had I'm Biff on the show. Guy. He's a, he's a nice guy, man. And uh, I'm sorry. I, I had Biff on the show. He's a very nice guy. Yeah. Biff's a great guy. And we, we developed a, a really good friendship over the years, but you know, this is the first time they're seeing me at all. So, you know, it's, I'm not going to say it was a cold room. It wasn't a cold room, but it was very much a wait and see room. Yeah, sure. Which is normal. It is normal. I didn't begrudge them that at all. You know, yeah. uh, I, but then I just did, you know, I just tried to do what I thought was right. And, you know, they warmed up. Um, man, what a nice, nice story. Thank you so much for sharing that. I got goosebumps when you said, when you told the whole thing, and that was really cool. <laughs> that was, that was, let me ask you a couple of questions. Um, so your wife was totally supportive of that as well. Oh yeah. 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 Um, I always, I'm curious about this because it's something I've learned only recently in the last five years. You said, you know, you've always been faith-based. You always had trust that God or the universe or whoever that spirit was for you was looking out for you, basically. Yeah, yeah. I, that, I mean, that's, yeah. I, um. Uh, you know, I got, I, I will say for me, I'm, I'm very much a believer mm. and, and I, you know, I'm a Christian and, uh, and I was, I was raised in the church. Okay. And, uh, and, and I just, it has always been a part of my life that, uh, I, I never doubted it. Sure. Sure. Uh, I, I, and it's not really saying it right, but, but it's, it's always been reality to me. Sure. And, and, and the, and, and I know I've had times where I fought it being the guiding principle, but, but I've, but I know it is the guiding principle of of my life. And, and, And I'm glad, you know, I'm glad it is. Um, I, I just, I don't think, I don't think humans are superficial beings. I think, I think they're deeper than just flesh. And then when you die, you're gone. And, and you know, you're, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. There's no, I, what I, what I admire about that is the people I have, I've spoke to 700 people pretty close to that now. 
And the people that have been open, like it's almost like a, it's like everything else in life. If whatever you believe, that's what happens to you, sort of. So you always had this mindset that, you know, the, the God is going to take care of me. If I listen. If you write. Well, that's the other part, too. Cause it's, <laughs> right. But you got to be. But that's part of being open. You can't say like, well, God's going to take care of me and I'm going to pay attention to the stuff I want to pay attention to. No, no, that's you can't do. Part. That's like you, you, that's not being open, man. That's being like. I don't like selfish kind of in a way. That's one from column A, one from column B. Yeah. But I always liked that because I was not a guy that was open to that. I just had, I had a rough upbringing. So I wasn't like open to like anybody looking after me, let alone a, a spirit. Yeah. You know, but as I've become more open to that um, and really listening, uh, I find more things or less stress in my life. Yeah. You yeah, know? There's, there's, there's peace. Uh, yeah. Know, beyond understanding, as they say. Yeah. And, and I really think that's cool. I admire, and I've had a lot of people on that were raised. You happen to know Doyle Dykes? Uh, I've met him a time or two, yeah. Yeah. Now, he was very immersed in the church. He was a little kid. Right. His, his dad was a pastor. He grew up in... Mm -hmm. uh, as he said, the wrong side of the tracks in Jacksonville. Um, but, you know, he, I, so I've talked to a lot of people like that. And it's just very interesting for me who grew up in a totally different type of environment to hear that and to be more open to that, because I think it's helped me. And I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about belief that there's a power greater than not there's anything wrong with religion, but that's not what I'm talking about. You know, I'm talking about just belief that there's somebody looking out for you there. If you're open yeah. to that. Well, religion is a process. You know, religion is a process of exercising faith for some. Yeah, for some people, yeah. But it's not the definition of faith. No, for yeah. sure, man. Because you got a lot of people I have met over the course of my life that are really religious. And I'm like, I don't, <laughs> you can't conduct, you can't say that you're religious, any relig whatever religion you are, and then be an asshole in your real life. I don't think that's compatible. <laughs> I mean, I don't know much about this, but I think that that's not compatible. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> Um, thank you, man. That was a really cool story. I appreciate you sharing that, Greg. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to mention some of the artists that you've worked with. And if you can talk about how you got the gig and any cool or interesting story about working with them, that would be cool. That would be great. Uh, let's start with Billy Gibbons. <laughs> <laughs> I like when you, when I mention a name and someone laughs, cause it's going to be fun. You're gonna start with the character. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what, he's a, he's a piece of work. He, he, uh, <laughs> I've known, I've known Billy on the periphery for a long, long time because they did so much work in Memphis. And I used to sneak into the storeroom at Arden, which was behind the Studio B control room where they would be working. I would sneak into the storeroom and listen to them work through the <laughs> wall. That's cool. And, and, and then when the music would stop, I'd run out in the hall and see if I couldn't you know, catch them in the hall and say hi and this, that, and the other thing. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I've known him a long time. I remember one, one time they were working on the album. It was going to be the El Loco album. It was after uh, uh, DeGuelo, the album after DeGuelo. And they were in Studio A, and I was wandering the halls. And Bill Ham, you know, their manager kind of. Yeah, mm -hmm, their guy. He decided, uh, for whatever reason, uh, he wanted a copy of, uh, of DeGuelo. He didn't have a copy of it. They wanted to reference something off of there. So he, Hey boy. Yes, sir. Mr. Ham, man, take this $10 and go down to pop tunes and get me a cassette of DeGuelo. Would you? <laughs> sure, sure, I, will. So I, run, I run down to the record store, grab, grab the cassette of DeGuelo. I think it was like seven ninety eight plus tax, right? He had given me a ten dollar bill, <laughs> and I come back and I hand I hand it to him and I hand him like, you know, a a dollar and sixty three cents worth of change. He said, "Won't you just keep the change, boy?" <laughs> <laughs> like, Thank you, sir. Yeah, right. Stuff <laughs> like a buck sixty three in my pocket, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, man. 
Yeah, but anyway, so it was just one of those things with Billy, you know, he was around town a lot. He had, he had girlfriends there and, you know, he just, he loved to come to town. And uh, how I, how I really started working with him uh, had to do with uh, a soundtrack thing. They were trying to get together from, from dusk till dawn. That, oh yeah. That movie. I remember that. that yeah. That movie. They had to get, a couple, they had to get a couple of things cut for that. And, uh, and we're having some issues. And, uh, and so my friend, Joe Hardy, the late, great Joe Hardy, who's amazing engineer and worked, worked with Gibbons. I guess he started with him on Afterburn, that, that album. And they were tight, 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 tight. Um, so they got me to come down to Houston and, and help them with a couple of things for that, that soundtrack. And, uh, and it just kind of, it kind of started a long, well, a relationship that goes on today. That's you know? um, and he, and he's, he's a sweet guy. He's a total piece of work, but, but, but a sweet guy. And you I played mean, on his last record. I played on his, both of his solo records. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Did you tour with him? No, no, he's, he, uh, to Billy's credit, he is he he knows what he needs, and and when he's out doing that stuff, he he needs style, and as you can see by my picture above your head right now, <laughs> I do not represent style <laughs> in any form of fashion. So, uh, hey, me and you both, <laughs> and, and that's okay with me. I I, I totally get it. Uh huh. I totally get it. So he had someone pimped out on stage with him, basically. Well, I think Matt Sorum did the last tour with him. Oh, okay, cool, cool. That's funny, man. Matt's a good-looking man. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, plus he comes from that world of, you know, being pimped out on stage, you know, and that's, oh, yeah. an image is a big part of – He's a yeah. great drummer. There's no doubt about it. I Absolutely. Mean, it's, all, it, it all, it's all good. That's cool, man. Any funny Billy stories that you could share without getting anybody in trouble? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can tell you, don't ever go shopping with him <laughs> because there's no limits to his credit cards. Right. And you will wind up. I, it's just amazing. It's just amazing what will show up sometimes when you're, when you least expect it. Uh, we'll be at the studio and trucks, trucks will come all day sometimes drop just dropping just madness just boxes of madness off that he that he sees like he, guitars or like a yeah, couch you know it could be both <laughs> or a guitar i mean it, 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 it's it's he it's just this unending stream of uh, of of stuff that he acquires it, it's it's like furry coats or something yeah. like that. Yeah. All that. Weird stuff. And, if, and, and going to eat. Like if you go to eat, he'll order two big silver serving pans full of tamales. He'll eat two of them and take the rest of them back to his hotel with him to, to <laughs> eat over the next two weeks. <laughs> you know, it, it's, he, he, it's just the funniest thing. So He's, like everything in excess kind yeah, of. Pretty much. Yeah, that's funny, man. Pretty much. Good for him. But I tell you what, he's he's an amazing artist, uh, like uh, just kind of impulsive sketch artist kind of thing. I've oh, got some, really? I've got, I've got some things he's done for me. You know, like I'll be out working on something, I'll come in, he'll hand me this drawing he just did. You know, of, hey, take this with you, man. I, I've got a couple of them framed in my house that are just really cool, just kind of impulsive. He did them in ten minutes, kind of things. You know, with like. One of them, uh, he had some butcher paper and some uh, white out and a black flare. And that was all he had and, and did these, these drawings. And I'm like, man, that's so cool, you know? That's awesome, man. Yeah. That's he's, really he's nice. Really, he's really, very much style and fashion he's real in tune to. You know, what, uh, in playing with him, he's one of these guys that, 
he's not playing anything complicated. But man, does it feel good. It does, and it's deceptive. I would contend that some of the stuff he plays on a song like Blue Jean Blues, right? some of those intervals he's doing uh, in the context of a straight blues tune are not typical at all. And, and, and some of those leaps, and it's like, ah, that's, that's pretty sophisticated right there. That ain't just your back porch foot stomping blues, you know? Yeah. That's, he's, he's, uh, he's got some depth in his compositional thing. Definitely. Really does. Um, Def- but when I meant te- it's not complicated, it's not like technically, you know, like there's a big emphasis now on technique. And no. I'm of the old, I want to feel good. I don't care like, if it's t- got technique or not great, but I want to feel no, something. He, 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 he kind of defines it in, in, in a weird kind of way. Oh my God. I mean, yeah, just, it's, it's deep. It's, it's, it is deep. Look at that song that you just talked about, Blue Jean. What a man! What a great tune that is, man. I, I mean, and stripped down, butt naked too. There ain't nothing on that record. I mean, there ain't nothing on it. And uh, you know, there've been some, there've been some neat live recordings of them early, early on, doing like Rattlesnake Shake and stuff like that, that popping up on YouTube. And man, you talk about a band breathing fire. Golly. Feel. I mean, they are just rending and tearing, man. It's just stunning. I'm going to go look for some of those because I love the older stuff, man. Those first few albums are just magic. Yeah. 38 Special, what'd you do with those guys? Man, I did a couple of records with them. Um, I did a record called Resolution with them in Memphis with Joe Hardy once again and uh, with Don Barnes and. Uh, Don was singing, and, and uh, Danny Chauncey uh, was in the band and doing a lot of the pre-production work and a lot of the writing and stuff, and, and, and Donnie Van Zandt. And, uh, it's a, it's a, I'm very proud of that record. I think it's a really good record. It, it's, it's a little bit of – it's not as wholly commercial as you always think a 38 Special as being. It has a little extra – a little extra oomph to it, but great guys, really sweet guys. And I wound up doing another record with them once I moved to Nashville. And I got to say, I, I can't recall if it ever actually came out or not, but I need to, I need to research that, see if it did, but they were always really good to work with and, you know, really sweet guys. I meant to ask you, you did work with Jimmy Webb. Was Fred Mullen, producing any of that Mm -hmm. i had him on the show recently and he's done so much work with uh with i mean they've been friends for like 30 or 40 years or something yeah yeah Yeah. i've done a bunch of stuff with fred he's always got his hand in a really uh, left to center stuff you know yeah jimmy webb stuff i mean he's you know he's he's legendary he's one of those guys i mean he's you know whoo that stuff he's written and to get, you know, to get to play his songs with him. Yeah. That's pretty cool, man. It's very special. And I, I I remember uh, we had, we had some actual real scores that we were playing to on that. And I had him sign a couple of them for me. Oh, that's cool. He was a real nice guy. You know, I think I had him sign a MacArthur park and, you know, maybe another one. That's nice, man. That's a classic song. No doubt. Jorgensen, what'd you do with John? Talk about a monster player, man. He is. I, you know, I did, I did one of his solo records. Um, uh, and, I, you know, I had, I had thought of the title of it because I knew this would come up. And now I've forgotten the title of the solo record. I did two of them. Uh, he, he, he did, um, he did uh, when the flood hit in Nashville, you know, he yeah. lost a lot of instruments and, and in the course of ga- getting his instruments back, he wrote a piece of music with each of them. Oh, that's, and, and, that's and cool. so, yeah. So we recorded these albums that were inspired by, you know, and I think all the titles were, you know, 62 SG. 
and <laughs> things like that. You know, th those were the titles of the songs. Yeah. You know, Cause he wrote them as he got these instruments back together. He wrote them. And John and I, we met through Chuck Howard and uh, emotional savant. That was the name of the solo record. I'm pretty sure. Uh, and it's just me and John, I think. Oh, did he I play bass? John, and I think he played everything else. Yeah, he's a very talented guy. Man. Oh man, it, it, he's a such a sweet guy, and uh, and and he and I hit it off really well. We had a had a bunch of things in common, you know, common tastes and things like that, and just um, I don't know. We we just found a kinship really really early up on meeting, with, you know, when we were doing some work for Chuck Howard, and. and um, we just it's just kind of stayed away. I did I did one of his guitar town things with him, you know, uh, there in Colorado. Yeah, and uh, that was fun. And, you know, I've always had a good time playing with him. It's funny he mentioned when I had him here on the show. He said, you know, one of the reasons I always buy guitars is every, in line with what you just said. He goes, every time I buy a new guitar, I'm inspired to write a song or two. And I'm like, that's a real convenient thing to tell your wife. He goes, <laughs> <laughs> he yeah. goes, it really is. <laughs> but yeah. it's true in his case, you know. And uh, yeah. yeah, he's such a talented guy. Um, Seeger, how did that yeah. come up? Well, and when was what period of time was that? Uh, I started with him in 2017. Oh, and so the last, his whole yeah. major. Did you whole just last, this whole last thing was me? Oh, I didn't know that. So you were out with Rob. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I guess, you know, it started, it started uh, with him seeing uh, me playing in the house band on an ACM award show. Oh. Uh, it was one of the, it was one of the years where the ACM was going to have the winners of the studio musician categories, you know, mm -hmm. they were going to have them be the house band for the award show. The, the, you know, the one they do in Nashville, not the Vegas one, the one they do in Nashville. Yeah. Year. Well, I didn't happen to win the ACM that year. Shannon Forrest won it, but he was not going to be able to play the show. So he asked me if I would sub for him. So I subbed for Shannon. And, uh, and Jim Brown, who, who has been in Seeger's band for a long time. And I've known Jim forever. He's one of the first guys I worked with and met when I, when I moved to town, known him for a long time. Anyway, he had been playing with Seeger. He was, he was the band leader on the show. Yeah. He was an MD because I had him on here a long time. He's an MD for Seeger too, I think, isn't he? Uh, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought. But Bob, Bob really relies on him for a lot and trusts him you know, implicitly and, and which is good. Um, but, um, anyway, um, Jim's band leading for this TV show. So Bob's watching, you know, Bob's tuning in to see Jim. And, uh, and so I, I don't really know what the impetus was that he, that he was noticing me, but he called Jim and said, you know, I saw I saw the TV show. Who's the drummer? And I'm and Jim says, well, it's it's a guy, Greg Moore. He said, I've actually mentioned him to you in the past. And uh, and he said, ah, oh, OK, well, good to know. Good to know. Well, a couple of weeks later, I got a phone call from from uh, uh, Bill Blackwell from from Seeger's office. He's putting together a session and wanted to know if if I could do this session, a recording session. And I'm like, well, yeah, of course. Yeah, I'd love <laughs> Bob Seeger. Be honored. So that was a, this a session was the first thing I ever did with him. We did this session. Seemed to go really well. Seemed to be, you know, he's a really hardworking guy too, man. He he he's he just is all about it all the time. Yeah. He's just consumed with what he's doing. But um, uh, anyway, we do this session, get it all done. Um, and about a month later, I get another phone call from Bill. He says, well, Bob would like to know if, if you ever considered, you know, doing any touring. And I'm like, well, I, I've always 
yeah, I've always, you know, done touring as I could. And, and, and you know, if anyone would ask, you know, I'd, I'd always consider those kind of things. And he said, well, could you, would you think you could, could come up and, uh, and play, you know, play with the band and just, just see how it goes. I'm like, yeah, I'd be glad to. So he said, well, uh, I'll get Bob to send you some music and, you know, send you. So about a week later, I get these CDs in, in the mail, you know, and they're all hand handwritten from Bob, you know, titles and all this stuff. I'm like, well, that's pretty cool. That is cool. You know? Did he tell you which songs to focus on in particular? Well, he sent me these, he sent me, yeah, he sent me, I think, seven or eight things. Okay. Initially. And, I, you know, so I start, I start woodshedding these things and, you know, and then I'm, th I'm thinking to myself, you know what? I'm going to listen a little ahead of some of this stuff and, and just kind of guess at some other things we might do. Right. So I, I start, start gathering some other stuff and, and kind of charting some things. And sure enough, I get up there and, and we get ready to play and nothing he had sent me on the disc. <laughs> they didn't play any of it didn't call any oh of them my like god the first hour and, and it, it wasn't him being malicious mm. he just gets something on his mind and he just goes with it he didn't yeah. he, he didn't have any more clue what he had sent me than anything and i ain't gonna tell him hey bob you didn't send me that right you know? right yeah well that's because sometimes they're gonna do that on purpose yeah and that's not him he, he's not right gonna do that. he just didn't remember it had been a month at that point yeah. You know, but, but we had a, we had enough, we had enough to, to get going. And, and, um, and I really wanted to, I wanted it to feel like nothing was out of place when I went up there, you know, yeah. they, they had been having Don Brewer play with them for years and years. And, and he's one of my heroes. Yeah. A great drummer. And, 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 and I didn't want anything to feel any less, than it ever felt with, you know, with Donnie or anybody else. I, I just did, I didn't want anything to be amiss at all. I didn't want to leave any doubt, you know, so I worked, I worked really hard on that. And, and, and I think, I think that's, I think we achieved that. I think, I think when I went in and played, I, it was just, there were a lot of smiles and that that's made, great, man. It made me feel really good that they were like, Oh crap. Let's go play. Can we book a gig this weekend? You know, that's awesome, man. Book a gig now. And you're the only guy, probably not from the Midwest, because he's heavy into like, where do you come from? Yeah, yeah. Uh, like McNelly and uh, uh, Mark, they're Chatfield, from Ohio. Chatfield, Ohio. Moose is like a Detroit guy, if I remember. Well, Correct. he was born there, but he was raised in Jonesboro. Right, but but everybody has this Midwest. I know Seeger's big on that Midwest connection. Yeah, man. He is. He yeah. Is. He is. Well, that's cool, man. He also he also you know some of his "Come to Papa" was a big Memphis record, and "Trying to Live mm. My Life Without You" was a big Memphis record. Mm. And okay, Nutbush, so you had that connection there. You know, Nut with Ike and Tina Turner. You know, that's Nutbush, Tennessee, is twenty miles from where I grew up. Right, you know, place. You know, and uh, so you know he. He's got that element about him too. He he knows that. So that's great. And that was a fantastic tour. Man, I gotta tell you, to to have gotten to do something like that at this point in my career arc, as they say, <laughs> was just I can't tell you, man. It was just stunning. It was just stunning. And 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 the band, I just felt mm -hmm. like the band just really, really played really well every night and brought it for him and, and and it was you know and and consequently he you know it raised his bar and you know what i mean mm. and it was just a real it was no computers no tracks no no stems no nothing if you if you heard it someone up there was playing it that's great and man there was no no assist at all you know it was every note of it was played and sang by the people you saw on stage and that's a rare commodity these days. Oh yeah. Is he, is he, do you think he's done or is he going to be coming out again sometime or? I couldn't speculate. Yeah. I know you he know, had that. I, I, I hope in my heart that there's, 
that there's more that we could do just because it was so fun. I would certainly yeah. understand if he, if he just decided he was done, but I don't know. He, he never struck me. I think music has been everything in his life, all of his life. And I, and I have a hard time imagining him not creating on some level or not wanting to perform because it's been his very existence. Yeah. And, uh, and so I don't know, I have a hard time accepting it, but yet I kind of have to accept it because that's what they've all said at this point. Right. Right. Well, hopefully fingers crossed, man, you'll be out again with them. Yeah, that'd be great. And man, one of my favorite, favorite players, Warren Haynes, what'd you do with Warren? I, I'm, he's supposed to come on here. He's aware of the show. He wants to come on. He's just so busy. I, I probably should reach out to them again now because nobody's yeah. busy. Yeah. No one's yeah. doing anything right now. Yeah. Fact, Warren's a great guy. And, and, um, the first time I ever met Warren, um, there's an engineer in town in Memphis named Jeff Powell. And, and he had been around Warren, I think, when Dowd was producing the Allman Brothers records that, that Warren played on. And they became buddies. And Jeff had to do some kind of project for a college course. And... And so he had talked to Warren about coming to Arden and doing three or four songs for this college course and, and had to put a band together and asked me to play on it. And so that's where I met Warren the first time. And once again, it was kind of like Jorgensen. We, we just, we just hit it off and, and became, became friends and, and, uh, uh, and had a great time and, and probably, I don't know, it was probably, a couple of years after that, he had he had signed uh, to do his solo deal. I can't. I wonder. If, I can't remember if it was Megaforce or what label it was on. It was on an Atlantic subsidiary, I think. But it was that Tale of Ordinary Tales of Ordinary, Tales of Ordinary Madness. Yeah, what a great. I, and he yeah. doesn't make any bad music. That guy. No, no, he doesn't. He doesn't play any bad notes. He's an incredible writer. I mean, he's just super talented dude yeah yeah i mean he was making his bones writing before any of all that yeah anyway i, I was still living in memphis and i got a call from him and, and you know he he was going to use his live band on half the record but he wanted uh, uh to bring me and johnny neal and michael rhodes in to play on the other half of the record and i had never met michael at the time it's the first time i'd ever Scene oh, that's funny. Michael, or Johnny, for that matter. And Chuck Lavelle was, uh, was, I think, producing or co-producing this record with him. Um, so we went to Atlanta and, and worked on, on that record. And, and, you know, once again, it was one of those experiences that puts you, you know, where you're, you're meeting people you've grown up hearing, you know, like Chuck, and, and, the, and then meet, meeting people that you've, heard about with Rhodes and Johnny Neal and, you know, Michael, the first time Michael and I ever played together, it was like, it was like he walked into my brain and knew everything I was going to do before I ever hit anything. He's, he, he's he, a talented he, uh, guy, man. He, uh, yeah, he, he, I'm trying to think of the proper word for it. He, it's just like he knows what's coming. You know, you have that communica communication with with another player, and, and he and I have he and I have that on a level not like most. Brignadello and I have it too, but but, but Rhodes and I, even with Bonamassa, you know, someone that I don't play with on a regular basis, I only come in when when Anton's out of out of kilter. You know, like if he's got something else he's got to do, or like when he broke his ankle or something. Yeah. Like that. But even then, you know, I'll walk in and it's just like we're playing these songs like we've been playing them for five years, you know, and and it's just it's just something. The the intuition, I guess, is what I'm saying. When That's the that. magic of that when you get that with somebody, man. Yeah, and That's those, so those cool. gigs are those gigs are so fun because it's basically a four piece band with two horns and and some singers, you know. So there's there's lots of room to roam. And, uh, and, and, and sometimes the challenge is, is not to roam too far. Sure. Because you got, you got guys that can really go on and, uh, and it's much more interesting hearing them roam than me roam. 
<laughs> and, uh, and so well, that's because you're a pro, man, and you well, foundationally, yourself. you know, you can't. You got there's got to be there's got to be a foundation, and 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 that that makes everything else have its space, and uh, and that's what's fun about that is getting to getting to kind of lay the cinder block so they can put the trim work on. So you were on half of Tales of Ordinary Madness. I am, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a that's cool. Did you play with him after that at all? Uh, no. What? Uh, any cool or funny or interesting Warren stories? You know, our our uh, not really. Our relationship has just always been very friendly and cordial, and uh, um, and pretty matter of fact. Yeah. Uh, you know, we. We're not we're not together enough really to have to have had those kind of moments. I guess sure. so it's kind of kind of tough. Totally get yeah. it. Yeah, that's nice, man. Uh, is any other gigs that you'd like to chat about that were cool or that you have fond memories of? Or man, one bit one in particular. It, yeah, with Sunny Landreth, I will tell you. Um, when when South of I-10 came out, we did we did a flurry of dates and we had. We had two weeks booked at the Chesterfield Cafe in Paris. Oh man! And uh, and man, you talk about getting getting to plant someplace for two weeks. Man, the shows just get more intense and more intense as they go. And man, by the time those two weeks were up, it was just it was brutal. You know how 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 good it was. And Sonny, you know, he, he's such a, um, you know, you hear him talking, you hear him sing, and it's, a, it's kind of a tender voice and, and, and all of this stuff. I guess he, he's, he's a gentle soul, you know, but man, what's coming out of him is just like, yeah, whoa. You tear it up, man. <laughs> yeah. Dave Ranther, Steve Kahn was playing keyboards, and Steve <laughs> – <laughs> Steve is hilarious and and he 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 was learning he was telling himself he was learning these phrases to speak to the audience and which and man every time he would try it he would just met with stone silence <laughs> it was just it was just cruel we would just look at each other and just go man Oh, he was learning a phrase to chat with girls in French. Yeah, it's That's not, so funny. It's not working for you at all. <laughs> That's that, was, that was a special time because that, that, I'm really proud of what I got to do on that record. I, I, I shared that record with Kenny Blevins. There's a couple of things we played on together on that record, but, but uh, we cut it down in, in uh, more east Louisiana. And it, was, it was an amazing experience. Bobby Fields you know, produced it. And, you know, Sonny's just Sonny, man. He, he, he's, he's that Delta, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. He's got it in his soul. Yeah, for yeah, sure. man. He does. He does. Yeah. What an unusual name. You said it's the Chesterfield cafe in Paris. Yeah. What an unusual name of a club in Paris. No. Well, I think they, I think they kind of, it was kind of set up to be uh, a club to showcase American music. I think. Yeah, that was it, from that perspective. It's smart. Yeah, yeah, that's a smart thing. But it, it was I mean, right there on the on the boulevard, the Champs de Lise or whatever that yeah main road is right there. You know, that's cool, man. Would you did you like uh, Paris? I did. Um, you know, it was it was this has been oh gosh, it was early nineties when we were there. So you know, I'm sure Paris has changed quite a lot since then. But I. I remember I took, you know, I took the subway. I went out to to Morrison's grave and. Oh, that's cool. Did all that. And, you know, Con, Steve, Steve Con and I wound up hanging out the most uh, in Paris. Just for whatever reason, it just worked out that way. Yeah. We run around a lot. And every time I would go to Europe or, or London in particular, I, uh, at the time, you know, record stores were still big business and you know i'd always come back with just sacks and sacks full of you know european pressings and stuff and european versions of yeah that used to be cool you get these bootlegs that they don't have here yeah, yeah. that was cool i spent a lot of time in record stores as a kid man <coughs> um this is a tough question 
knee jerk reaction, top three experiences you've had musically. Oh, that changes daily. I get it. Just for now, whatever you're feeling right now, right now. Well, you know, getting, uh, playing, um, uh, Pine Knob in the summer in Michigan, three weeks running with Seeger, sold out every night. <laughs> you know, it, it can't possibly get much better than that. It's because so much of this is fresh in my memory, playing, you know, playing the L.A. Forum with him. Because uh, when I was a kid, I was a big Three Dog Night fan, and one of my favorite records was Captured Live at the Forum. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you hear L.A. Forum, L.A. Forum, L.A. Forum, you just think that's, you know, and Madison Square Garden, or the inside of the Closer to Home record, you know, is Grand Funk at Madison Square Garden. Right. I, you know, I played both of those buildings on that on that Seeger tour. You know, so... It's a pretty cool... <laughs> it's a pretty cool uh, bucket list to check off. Well, it is. It is. And, and you know, I got to say, one, one of the ones that I have uh, that was really fun and special in a, in a crazy way, it was a substitute gig. I was actually subbing for Michael Cardelloni uh, with Skinner. Uh, he, I got a call from him, and I've known Ricky Medlock from – Years ago with Blackfoot, they used to come through Memphis all the time. I used to go see them in clubs in Memphis. So I knew Ricky well. And I, at this point, I had worked on a couple of Skinner records um, uh, up to then. Anyway, I get a call uh, from their management, and they, they said, Michael has a European vacation booked with his family that they've had booked for a year. And the University of Florida – has called and wants Skinner to come play homecoming at, at the Swamp, at the University of Florida football stadium. That's a weird request. <laughs> they want Skinner to come. And I'm, and they said, man, do you think you could ever do something like that? I'm like, well, yeah, yeah. I'd be glad, you know, first of all, I'm glad to help out. I'm, you know, glad to yeah. you know, understand, you know, Michael's got this vacation book with his family and, you know, uh, but yeah, I, I'd love to do it. And so we, we go down there and, you know, once again, I'm playing stuff I've known all my life, mm, yeah. you know? but, but I mean, when you're there and, and Gary's over there and Billy Payne was still living, you know, and he's playing keys and, and you're just looking around and you're, you know, man, I saw Skinner, I saw Skinner just kill Eric Clapton at the stadium in Memphis in 74. Just <laughs> him. And, and, and I mean, I'm on, st- you know, yeah, I, you know, everybody's going to say, well, it ain't really Skinner. Well, it's as much as Skinner as you can have. Yeah. At that and, time. Absolutely. And, and still part of the legacy. And, and believe me, they take it very seriously. Yeah. You know, like, regardless of what you think about it, they take yeah. it very seriously. And man, when, when we, when we hit the stage in that stadium, they went nuts. I mean, they went crazy because that's their backyard, you know, yes. Jackson and Gainesville and all that stuff. And, and I mean, we, I, I played the full tilt Monty Freebird down to the Bolero ending with Skinner in Florida at the Florida homecoming. That's that was, so cool, man. It was very cool. It was very cool. Yeah. That's nice, man. All right, so Seeger, Skinner, what would be number three? Oh, gosh. I would say I, 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 you know, Rodney Crowell was one of the first guys I, I wound up working with in Nashville, and Rodney's my neighbor now. I'm sitting here looking at his driveway right now. It's <laughs> funny. But – uh. He called one day. He said, man, I got a special song I want to do. He said, uh, can you just come in and do this one song? I'm like, well, yeah, man, I'd be glad to. He said, I, you know, I, don't, I ain't going to tell you about it. I'll just, you know, we'll show up. We'll just work it up. We'll, we'll do this song. So come to the studio. And um, he said, uh, this is a song called – walk the line revisited and i'm like cool he said yeah it's it's about he said it's about 
the first time I ever heard I Walk the Line on my dad's car radio. He said, you know, it just left such a mark on me. And, uh, and, and so we start working this song up and, and then I notice a little kerfluffle kind of in, in the other part of the room and Johnny Cash has walked in. Holy smokes. And he said, Oh, by the way, I didn't, I didn't tell you, but Johnny's, Johnny's going to sing the choruses on this song. And he goes out wow. and gets, gets in his room, puts the headphones on and I'm playing this song and we get to the chorus and there's Johnny's voice in my headphones. I keep a close watch, on, and I'm just losing my cookies. That's so awesome, man. It just, yeah. I mean, you know, being from Memphis, Sun Records, you know, you could buy Sun Records at any dime store, convenience store, anywhere in West Tennessee because it was right there. They just take them in the trunk of their car and drop them off. Yeah, you know, like magazines. Yeah, yeah, it was a rat jobber, they would call them. Yeah. And, and uh, so, I mean, they were just everywhere. Everybody had all the Sun Records. Everybody had. You know, it was big doings back then. So, yeah, we were so steeped in all of that, you know. Did, and did you and I remember I eventually, I think I ran home at lunch or something, and uh, I had my grandmother's copy of a 78 of Get Rhythm, and, uh, and I brought it back up, and he signed it for me. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah, it was very cool. Uh, did you ever get to play with Reggie? I had the late Reggie Young here. Yeah, I did. You did? Because sure he was out of Memphis. I know. Yeah, he, he's an Arkansas boy originally. Yeah. But yeah, his, his bones were cut there at American. And actually at Royal, uh, when, he, when he was doing Bill Black's combo stuff, prior to, prior to all the American stuff, you know, he was doing those instrumental dance records with, with Bill Black's combo that basically they were just being made to service jukeboxes because they, uh, they were, that was a very incestuous business that they had, they had a studio, they had pop tunes, popper tunes record shop, and they also had the vending business. So oh, wow. They, they would cut their own records to put on their own jukeboxes. That's clever as hell. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, Thanks, man. Some really good stories you shared. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, Greg, any low points? So tell me about the low points that you've had to deal with in life and how'd you get through them? You know what? I just let them roll on by and I don't dwell on them. Uh, I mean, the low points are always, you know, when you lose someone. I lost my dad when I was still a pretty young man. I was 40. And he was a really young man and died way before his time, you know, low points are generally stuff like that. Yeah. When, you know, family that has cared for you and you've cared for and y'all have loved each other growing up and had each other for all those years, you know, when they're not in your physical presence anymore, you have to find a way to, you have to allow their presence to stay with you. And, uh, It's all right, man. Take your time. And I, I have, I have a lot of those presents. I'm sorry. No, man. There's <clears throat> nothing that I carry with me. You know, that stay with me. They do stay with me, and they have stayed with me. And that keeps it from being so low. But I'm grateful for that. Man, I'm glad you have those great memories to hang on, man. Yeah, yeah. Which is great. Uh, yeah. You have ki you have kids, right? One daughter. One yeah, daughter. One daughter. She'll how, how be 30 old? this year. Yeah, she's the same age as my oldest son. You know? Yeah. And it's funny because I don't know if, if you've experienced this, but I could tell my son is kind of now aware of the fact that I'm not going to be here forever. And, you know, he's been very tender. And I mean, there's no reason, thank God, you know, I'm, I'm not that I know of, there's nothing going on, but I noticed that in him and it, it's a nice feeling that he, uh, I'm sorry that I'm sad that he even has to think about that, but it's a nice feeling to know that he, 
that's him you know that he has a feeling about that well that he has an appreciation of the relationship and yeah. and, and wants to uh make the best of that yes and, that's eloquently know, it, put you don't you don't want to dwell on inevitabilities like no, that hell no um, but yeah you do have to appreciate the here and now and and, and what's here in your hand well, so important man that's like the most important thing yeah it is it is very important thank you man i appreciate you sharing that okay. uh this is a tough question favorite musicians you've enjoyed playing with <laughs> you can probably put me in an encyclopedia or worth yeah boy that's just oh gosh I don't know that there's ever been anybody I haven't enjoyed. That sounds like a cop out. No, I understand. It's not a cop out because there's there, you get something every time. You get something every time you sit with someone and share and share that dialogue. There's something there, yeah. and you pick up something. Uh, gosh, I, I just I don't even know. You know, I would say probably Sonny just because I'm so constantly amazed at what he can do and, 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 and that he can play like that and sing like that and write like that all at the same time. I, I think Sonny's one of those ones, you know, that's, that's – it's just a different level. It's just yeah. – and he's been so true to what he does, you know. Um, so I guess from that standpoint, you know, he's certainly one of them. Pat McLaughlin uh, as well on, uh, you know, we, we do, we do shows with Pat outside of the headliners that that's oh, okay. his material and his band is a really special band with, with Kitty Greenberg and Michael Rhodes and he and myself. And, and sometimes Chad plays with him too. You know, Chad's, Chad's done a number of things with Pat. And I think he would probably say the same thing that, that that band is, is a pretty special little outfit. Top again, knee jerk reaction just for now. Top three desert Island discs. Hmm. <laughs> Man. You're going to have a lot of dead air to edit out here. Cause I'm <laughs> no, it's all, you know what? I'll tell you, I always think of this, this guy emailed me one time, a listener. And he said, he goes, I love how when you ask your guests about the low points in their life, they freely tell you about, you know, family loss, addiction, getting sober, stressful financial things. But when you ask them their three favorite records, they are tied up in knots. <laughs> and I always think of that. It's very accurate. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's an honest to God truth. It's, it's a it's, tough question. Man. It's tough. Because, you know, you have the things that were so formative to you that you, that you wouldn't be yourself without, but yet, you know, maybe they're not absolutely the things you would listen to when, if you only had three to rotate between. Yeah. You know, um, it, it would be tough. Uh, I'm going to answer this. I'm going to answer this. So just, just give me a minute. No, it's all good, man. I would, okay. I would, I would, I would put probably ZZ Top Trey Zombres in there. Just because it's such an amazingly well done basic face shredding rock album. Amazing. Sure is. Um, um, whew, okay. Let's see. That's one. Probably the UK version of, of, of the Beatles revolver because it has things on it that the American version doesn't have. And it makes a more cohesive picture just cause I can't, I can't accept not having it around there. There's a, there's a collection of it's called little Richard's 17 original grooviest hits. 
<laughs> and it, it's the uh, it's the original specialty recordings of his singles. You know, not, not re-records or anything like that. It's the original the original recordings. And man, there's just nothing there's nothing more exciting than Ready Teddy or or you know Good Golly Miss Molly or Keep a Knocking. It, it, it's just I mean the sheer force of that. You just got to have that. You just got to have that. Around. Anything with the word grooviest hits is a good record in my mind. Yeah. And, you know, that will change. Oh, same. yeah. This is, yeah. So this is why people hire you, though, man. You're a, you're a man who gives 100%. That was, that was commitment to the, on that question. And that's what, that, no, but how you do one thing is how you do everything, man. So, like, that, seriously, that's what, that's how shit works, right? You know, you're either like, in a hundred percent or you're not and you're in a hundred percent man thank you that was great uh another tough question man what do you like most about yourself i really work hard at not at not holding a grudge that's really great because that just weighs you down a hundred percent. Yeah. You know, forgiveness, I always thought it was for the other person. It's not, mm -mm. it's for you. It's yeah. as much for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for sure. Most important thing your dad taught you. Hmm. Boy, that's a tough one because we had we had a very unusual relationship. Um, or most important thing you learn. Sometimes you learn like not what not to do. It was more that. Yeah, that's important. It was more that. So, so it was kind of by default. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was kind of by default. How about your mom? Most important thing she taught you. <clears throat> um, probably. The the human version of unconditional love, you know, there's the godly version of that, but there's also <clears throat> person to person, you know, mother to daughter to son to father to, you know, yeah. whatever. Um, lo loving your people unconditionally, whoever your people are. That's the number one answer it's, for, it's, for that it's, question. Yeah, it's it's tough because sometimes those people get themselves into situations. It's really hard to love them through. I mean, and and self inclusive. You know, yeah. sometimes I behave in ways that I would think makes it hard for anybody to love me that way. <coughs> yeah, that's why that word unconditional. That's what. Yeah. Yeah, and man, I, I've seen it. I've seen it on levels that I, I that I'm not sure I could execute you know i've seen it in other people's lives and i'm just going oh man how <laughs> you know but it's there do you have any hobbies outside of music or interests uh i've always i've always enjoyed motorcycles and and cars uh I, I, not like hot rods or anything like that but just just like you know 50s automobilia that kind of stuff um i do uh, i do some fabricating drum work wise you know i like i like the building aspect of it and i do and i do i have historically done quite a lot of that when i worked at a shop in memphis and uh we did a bunch of custom work for a lot of people and, 
and that's always a nice diversion just operating different sides of your brain and one of the things i've liked about home recording so much i uh, you know, like I said, I've always had studios ever since I was a, a teenager. I've been involved in studios on one level or another. And 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 working on music from that from that side of things, uh, you know, it gives you a whole nother well of stuff to pull from in, in how you treat your instrument, how you tune and sounds and blah, 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 you know, when, when you're when you're facing it from the other side of the window. Sure. Different ball game, but you're also just working other areas of your brain. And I enjoy that. Right on, man. Two more questions, Greg. And, uh, man, you're a joy to talk to. Thank you so much for everything. Oh, man, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of that has been intentional and how much is a natural part of aging? Hmm. Changing my personality, I'd like I'd like to think that I've gotten a little less less self centered. That was my dog Levon. If you heard that, run. <laughs> oh, I didn't hear it. <laughs> name from Levon Helm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Actually, his name's Ramblin' Levon. Right on, man. He is named for Levon Helm. But uh, but and and I think as you have children and 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 they grow up and the, and they you know i th i think it, the natural thing is to is to become more you come become more centered on them and 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 trying to help them and get them along and and i think that takes a little of the self em emphasis off um, and then I, I you know i think you just learn eventually that it kind of is more fulfilling on some level uh to be put to be not always taking, you know, oh, yeah, and and and, uh, and at least trying to give something to somebody, you know, or something to something, but 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 putting out instead of just always gathering, and I you know I say that as I have you know a room full of drums and guitars and stuff and all that stuff upstairs, but you know that's my trade and uh i think you're talking about more like emotionally yeah, putting out am, or support I, wise I, caring and i i just i just know that there's going to be that fact that, well, yeah, well, you got all this stuff and blah blah blah, blah. you know people are going to say that no but I, that's not the context i don't think you were talking about it i mean you what's wrong with having stuff that doesn't mean like you know yeah you just don't let the stuff doesn't possess you yeah right 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 well uh Last question, and I will tell you, you've given me a lot here, so thank you. You've uh, done that. Uh, and you might have just answered it, and the question was, most important lesson that life has taught you? Ooh. I, you know, you just got to pay attention. You have to pay attention to it. And it's, and it's worth paying attention to yeah man because it's because this aspect of it is finite and uh and, and it and it's an amazing you know blessing to have <laughs> absolutely to drawing breath on this earth and uh and getting to share experiences with with people I don't know. That's, uh, that's one of the things I'm most grateful about, you know, for me, there was just, there was never any question ever in my life that this was going to be my path. And, 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 and I think that's, that gets back to the, to the faith thing. I, you know, I just, I just wandered off down this path hopefully with open minds and an open heart and, and tried to stay out of trouble and, and just do a good job with the opportunities that came my way and appreciate them and pay attention to them. And, uh, and that's why this has led me to, to, to right here right now. It's just, it's just trying to pay attention. And I think you've done a good job listening.
<laughs> by all by all standards, man. Uh, I appreciate it. I, I, I will I, now. I'll spend the rest of the afternoon pondering all of this. <laughs> <laughs> could, could be worse. <laughs> Hey, man, uh, let me tell people where to find you. First of all, thank you, man. You're a lovely guy. You're very sincere, and I really appreciate it. And you did give me a gift oh, today, so thanks, man. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate you asking me to do this. It's not something I get asked to do very often. but I don't know um, why, man. You're great at it. You should be doing these all day. You should be freaking speaking. Well, it's it, like I told you when we were getting started, I, I always figure out something that I'm, that I'm needing to know. Yeah, you know, always something comes up at the top. It's like, oh boy, yeah, I, I needed to be reminded of that. So um, that's good. Well, cool, man. Let me tell people where to start. Uh, where to find? It's Greg Morrow, uh, man. Uh, he he is not all over the internet, but uh, you know, if you want to connect with Greg, uh, one thing I really would like you to do, man. He has made a commitment to start posting on Instagram. <laughs> so I would like everybody listening, just grab your phone and go to Instagram and it's Greg Morrow 45. And it's a picture of Greg uh, as a Simpsons character, which is another story, but uh, follow him on there, man. And then tell him, Hey man, I heard you on everyone loves guitar. I loved your interview. And, and tell me where the caption window is. <laughs> tell, him, tell, him where the caption, tell him where the caption window is. No, but follow Greg on Instagram. That would be really cool. Uh, if you are, look, he's got a home studio. He's always worked out of a home studio. And in fact, he did most of the stuff for Billy F. Gibbons solo records uh, out of that. If you are, if you want to have Greg play with you or do some tracks, or if you're looking for cons some consulting or guidance on rhythm stuff or putting that aspect of whatever you're doing together, send him an email. Uh, I'm going to give you his email address. Please just like, don't, disrespect that he's busy like all of us are and if you do email him just let him know hey I, I heard your interview and uh you know here's what I've got going on and here's why I think you'd be a good fit and I'd like your help with the following things just be specific so he can answer you in a reasonable manner yeah. his email is gringo star it's like ringo star two r's at the end with a g so it's gringo g-r-i-n-g-o-s-t-a-r-r -R, at mac.com and um also on ebay He's got a bunch of CDs with the world famous headliners. If you go on there, if you want to uh, buy, a, buy a CD from him on there, email him and tell him you're going to buy a CD, give him your email address or whatever, but he'll sign it for you if you like that. So let, him, uh, let him know a heads up. And uh, again, Instagram, Greg Morrow 45. Oh, you want to blow this guy's. <laughs> He's going to be like a, an influencer like by the time this is over. Uh, anything I forgot or anything else you want to mention? No, man. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, it's my, honestly, my pleasure. Hang on a sec. Let me wrap this up and thank you for everything. Uh, uh, everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thank you very much to Greg Morrow. Again, uh, if you're interested in working with him and helping him, having him help you with tracks, whether it's laying them down or giving you some consulting or guidance on putting them together, email him at gringo, G-R-I-N-G-O, star with two R's at mac.com. Anyway, man, thank you. And uh, everybody, listen, especially in these times, remember most importantly that happiness really is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice. Go play your guitar or your drums and just enjoy life and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Greg, thank you so much, brother. Thank you. See ya.